Hi, everyone. <clears throat> right, thank you to be here. Uh, a lot of parallel sessions and very interesting. So thanks to be here. Um, today, we will present you something that is actually not directly linked with the remote sensing uh, um, open earth, earth observation. Uh, still, so I'm here to get out of my comfort zone and help you get out of yours. <laughs> so hi, I'm from uh, Open Science Lab for Biodiversity, a team uh, uh, based at the um, Research Institute of Nature and Forest of the Flemish Authority. Uh, so we do open science and uh, we try to provide some data publication, data publishing, uh, open workflows and <clears throat> open app packages. So just to be to give a little of context, um, what you see here is part of a big cube project, the Horizon project here, uh, Horizon um, project, which has, of course, some challenges. Uh, so try to uh, um, provide rapid, reliable, repeatable biodiversity monitoring data to um, researchers to get uh, some kind of uh, awareness for policymakers and to provide standardized access to biodiversity data in some way to impact the biodiversity loss and change. Um, so we try to provide the integration of data on biodiversity from different sources. So in some way, there is a space for remote sensing, of course. Um, well, actually, what we are speaking today is this part, because this project started just this year. And uh, this is uh, the starting point of everything. But the idea is what remote sensing uh, is present is uh, here, here. So the, this key point is uh, making data, uh, let's say analysis ready data for integration with other source of data. Um, so the end is to create workflows that are open and repeatable. And uh, there will be also space for deep learning. Again, this is not the key of my presentation, but just to give you a context. So why, uh, this, what is the use of biodiversity data cubes in the whole project? And uh, so, so we try to create example workflows, integrating with deep learning and to provide at the end some automated workflows and everything as provided by, as required by Horizon uh, should be open and reproducible and repeatable. So it's a consortium with a lot of partners, of course. Uh, but first of all, I want to say that uh, uh, this is my institute, but GBIF is part of a consortium. Who does, who from you knows what GBIF is? One, two, three. Okay, uh, not so much. Uh, because the idea of what is GBIF? GBIF is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. It's a network and data infrastructure. Um, and it is uh, uh, something that uh, is intergovernmental, so governments of, uh, I think, 50 countries in the world and uh, are uh, financing. So it's definitely a long-term project. Uh, they are based in Denmark and um, these are also a lot of associated uh, countries. So it's broader than European Union. So why? Why we need the occurrence data cube, uh, which in a, in a moment we will understand what it is, but uh, it's the typical, <laughs> in some way, you know about the environmental biodiversity loss and so on. So we have to do that. We have to do something that is repeatable, scalable and automated. So we need analysis ready data. And what it is now, this kind of cubes. Um, but first, what is a biodiversity occurrence? Uh, well, the evidence of the occurrence of a species or other taxon at a particular place and a particular time. So occurrence can be described as events in a three-dimensional space 
or fourth dimensional space because uh, as you see, you have a taxonomy, but you have uh, time and you have space. So in my representation, space is just one dimension, whatever you can split in X and Y, you have four dimension, but that's not the point, no? So from occurrences to occurrence cubes, well, of course, you need to choose a reference grid and you have to choose to, to do that uh, in each dimension, of course. Um, a taxonomy level, a space level, so a space grid, and also a time granularity. Uh, in this example, uh, I used uh, in a previous project where uh, these prototypes of these um, cubes were generated. I was using the EEA reference grid, so the European Environmental Agency uh, Union, um, European, European Environment Agency uh, grid at one kilometer level. So in some way, you can think about a tabular representation of this in this way to the ear, the cell code, which is a unique identifier of the grid cell and the species key, this kind of unique identifier within GBIF data of the species and the number of points, let's say, getting in. The point, I said points, but actually that's the point of my presentation. We have a spatial uncertainty, so we shouldn't speak about points. So from Oculus to Oculus cubes, an overview, uh, this is a kind of workflow uh, again, um, but uh, we have first to specify constraint, what, when, and where, and the granularity, as I said. And then you need to access data quality, harvest occurrences from GB, solve uncertainty, and aggregate. So first, typical things, we need to make some kind of uh, constraint defined, for example, in this example, Belgium between 20, uh, 2000 and 2018, and uh, a genus, uh, then we specify granularity. So we want a species level, so you have different species within this genus, time, year level, and spatial, this kind of grid that we use. Okay, you download the data in a in R or Python, you can do it, but you can also do it in the BLR web, of course. Um, and then you do access uh, data quality because you have to filter things that uh, you don't need. Typical process, I think. Uh, I don't speak so much about this. It's called something with uh, is flagged with some issues. And uh, next point, you have to solve some taxonomic uncertainty. All right. That's easy in some way because uh, nowadays you have taxonomic backbones, for example, the GBIF uh, taxonomic backbone. You can solve the temporal uncertainty, which is in some way trivial for the most typical aggregation levels as uh, year. But then you have a spatial uncertainty. Spatial uncertainty is the most difficult, I think, um, because uh, sometimes if you directly assign coordinates to grid, can lead to a huge spatial bias. Why? Because some data are in some way already aggregated. So a monitoring campaign, let's say at five by five or 10 by 10 uh, kilometers square. So you have a centroid of these points if you just use these points uh, as a lat latitude longitude. So you see in this case, uh, eh, the, num the, the red square here, in some way you have a structure which is actually artificial. So how to solve it? We are thinking about uh, this method to solve it. Um, so we try to use the uncertainty that is already in the data, uh, spatial uncertainty, to assign the grid to each point. So in some way, you have to think about that Occurrences, observations are not points in space. They are circles. Circles or square, if depending how you uh, describe your data on GBIF, but typically uh, people agree to describe uh, occurrences, in sp especially with a centroid and uncertainty. So you get circles. So in this case, for example, you assign the point to this square, even it could be in all of this region. This is a white edge case where you have small uncertainty, but is uh, uh, 
the area overlap two different grids. This is the greatest <laughs> example. This is easy to solve. So taxonomically, it's easy. We have synonyms, lower ranks, but this is done by the backbone. Time is quite trivial. Space, we use this random assignment. So what I show before now gets to this. Why? Because as I said, so you have multiple points assigned to a kind of grid, sal, and you count how many are there. But you are not definitely sure that uh, these points are falling in this grid cell until you have a minimum code uncertainty that's quite low. So in this way, we are quite sure that uh, this cell is very likely occupied because there is at least one point of, among these 50 ones with a very low minimal coordinate uncertainty. This is uh, the opposite. The, the, uh, the probability that this cell is occupied is quite low because you have an uncertainty that's quite high. It's almost three times the dimension of, this, of a grid cell. So how to use it now? Um, well, one thing that some colleagues did, uh, oh yeah, we make some maps about the occurrence cubes. Well, 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 it's not so easy. And as a physicist, which deals with uncertainty, and I like to always to stress it, uh, well, if you repeat the random assignment, you get a different cube. Yes? So this is, is, is wrong. This is a uh, fake news <laughs> because actually we have real data like this. So you cannot make this assignment without maybe telling to the user that actually these cells have a very high uncertainty. So maybe this one can be here. This one can be here, okay? There are, of course, other ways to visualize this. That's, uh, that's for sure. But at least think, take in mind that there is this kind of message we have to always provide uh, to the users data have an uncertainty. Um, OK, so now, how to deal with the intrinsic spatial uncertainty then? Solution one, make cubes with precise enough data only. Perfect. Solution two, similar. Remove cells with high minimal coordinate uncertainty. Quite the same, but uh, you do a kind, a kind of filtering afterwards. Both have a kind of downside. Do you have enough data left to make some analysis? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And what to do with some statistics, like as I told, the number of occupied grid cells in general. Sometimes you are removing data, which actually can be interesting to use, even if you are not so precise. So um, that's now the point, uh, the stability of statistics. Um, Okay, we know random assignment step generates different cubes from same occurrences. So now how stable are these summary statistics uh, such as the observed occupancy? Uh, what is the minimum number of cubes needed to robustly infer the average observed occupancy and its uncertainty? It's, uh, this is what uh, I want to, to show you here with some simulations. Uh, so we took a Monte Carlo simulation, that means uh, repeating, repeating uh, this random assignment thousand times and uh, shown here. This is a very uh, bad example, of course. So something like this, it doesn't happen so frequently in a, so it's quite a hard, hard test for the, for the method. Um, so you make 1000 cubes with 10 points and you see what happens. So what you can see is that uh, for each cell, I just give some example. So you give a number one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, so one, two, three, four, five, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on to these cells. And you, for some of this, it's easy. The cell is almost never occupied. 
or is almost always occupied like this. And you can make some some nice graphs saying, okay, how many cubes generate uh, this kind of occupancy? So, for example, seven grid cells occupied is the most probably most likely uh, value. And you also can show that uh, this kind of value seven, it's given when you have a, a a threshold of probability around 0 0.25, 0 0.5. This means it's just uh, um, taking the overlapping of circles in the square. So you have set circles, you calculate how many uh, area of these circles uh, fall in the grid, and you get kind of the sum, and you get these probabilities. So you see that uh, if you get the probability very high, uh, level, then you get only one, two, three, four uh, cells. But uh, if you get down, you get at so at this level of probability, you have uh, the seven numbers, the seven. So um, the the mean number of uh, occurrences per grid cell. It's, quite, it's not really stable, of course, because this is an analysis at, at grid cell. So for each grid cell, you want to know how many um, occurrences are falling in. So this is, of course, is quite fluctuating. Um, the same for the probability of occupancy per grid cell, but still it's getting something better. Um, and uh, what uh, I want to show is when you get the sum of, of cell occupied and the observed occupancy, then the things get slightly better. So remember, if we choose this kind of values of probability, so you get in this range uh, and you zoom on it, you see that uh, number seven or six of eight, let's say, is well represented and you get uh, around uh, tens of cube, you get already a very quite stable results. Um, even slightly less can be also possible. So it's a work in progress, of course. So very important from one side, the technical uh, specification of the cubes, how to make them um, in a way that uh, is not just you doing in your R or Python as I was doing. Uh, well, this part is done by GBIF, which is uh, uh, part of a consortium, and GBIF is now building a service to produce and download occurrence cubes following uh, users' preference. So uh, in the slide that I will share with, um, on the platform, uh, Mattermost, uh, I add a link so you can get the specs that have been already written to get this. Uh, it's a version one of the specs. And um, so that's already a big, uh, and this, for example, about format, you will get cubes in ZAR and other uh, formats that are quite um, consumable uh, for um, cloud and for um, high performance computing. On the other side, we have to study for the, the convergence of observed occupancy on real data and the other synthetic data I did already few days ago, the first studies on uh, uh, real data, and uh, they, are, uh, they seem to converge quite fast, faster than uh, the simulation, of course. But uh, still, I need to do it on a, on a larger scale to see what's happening. Um, also, something that can be interesting to know is that uh, the, the coordinate uncertainty uh, of this data following the Darwin core standard that is followed by GBIF to um, describe this data, biodiversity data. Well, the, um, the idea is that you use a uniform distribution. Uh, so these circles, any pointer in this circle has the same probability to, to occur, let's say. Uh, but if you use GP data, which are uh, collected via GPS, actually, is a kind you can you can be a little more stricter, and 
even if it's not uh, uh, strictly a Gaussian process uh, GPS, uh, um, we can still think about something more strict and using, let's say, a uh, Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution. So you have you see, this is something that they also can be studied. Thank you. And uh, I hope I was in on time. <laughs> Thank you, Damanu. Does anyone have? Hi. Thanks for the interesting presentation. Um, my question would be, which kind of species do you actually count in this data cube? I don't know if you had mentioned it, but like which kind of animals are in there? Are they birds and elephants and butterflies or whatever? Um, yeah, good question. I um, let's say that uh, the prototype of the cubes that uh, I was doing for a trials project, a, a kind of uh, uh, the parent of the big cubed. I made cubes uh, for Belgium, Italy, uh, Romania, and other countries, and they're on Zenodo, and they are uh, for everything. Let's say plants, birds, because I mean, this is a kind of a taxon agnostic system. Um, of course, as always, uh, when you go global uh, in taxon and whatever, you have some things that you have to think about. For example, machine observations are in these cubes, but machine observation, it means that uh, you have maybe one bird and it is uh, observed thousand times or million of times because uh, it's just sending GPS tracking data, for example. So some way you could maybe filter, for example, machine observations to get more precise data and getting only. So there is a lot of filtering, of course, uh, and this is part of it. So I, I made some cubes and I documented how I did it. But the idea is that everybody, thanks to be cubed now, uh, next year, GBIT will provide this service first in a test phase and then for everybody. So the idea is to provide uh, a way to get the data cube that you want uh, based on your filtering. So as you filter occurrences, you can decide, okay, I want a data cube with only this data and only machine observation of only human observation, whatever. Thank you very much for the nice um, talk. I was um, thinking about um, sparseness, um, since uh, most uh, taxa are just only occurring in a couple of uh, places. I would expect that there's uh, lots of zeros in your data cube. Sure. And data cubes in itself are more or less optimized um, for dense data it's instead. So is it um, about um, the blurring due to the error, which makes it more dense? Uh, well, just to, to make things easier here, uh, when I, I made this cube, again, I made prototypes, so I was still in CSV, and, uh, but uh, the idea is to only use, uh, there is a big difference between absence, real absences and zeros. Uh, and this is a very crucial thing. Well, this uh, data cube is just removing the zeros. The zero are not part of a cube. That's the idea. But I don't know. And then maybe I didn't understand very well the. Um, so there's lots of rare taxa. And usually you, you use a normal relational database, for instance, if your data is um, sparse. And uh, maybe um, if we are only going to use the uh, um, very high frequently abundant um, species being prevalent all across um, the area. Uh, maybe uh, we can only use those um, for the data cube um, because we do not want to spoil it uh, with zeros. Yeah. Well, about the technical part, how you uh, store the cubes and how you make uh, all the calculations, that's part of GBIF. And uh, so I'm not really the best person to answer to that. Uh, they're very good uh, in, uh, in uh, getting uh, terabytes of data and so on because GBIF has now so many occurrences it's uh, and they are processing uh, very good and so i think they can take care about that okay thank you very much
Okay, thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I was uh, thinking about the problem you mentioned that when you assign a point to a cell, if there is some uncertainty, you have to do it randomly. And then you cannot show that in a map because that would be, uh, that would not be reproducible. So I was wondering, um, have you considered instead of assigning randomly the point to one of the cells that fall into the uncertainty circle uh, to split that count into all the cells? That that fall that have an intersection with the with the circle proportionally to the overlap area or whatever that would make the map stable stable but I don't know if that would not be useful for the purposes you're doing it. That's a great question and indeed it was a, our first idea was indeed to do that <laughs> to just count portions so to get let's say real numbers fractions decimal numbers instead of uh, integers, uh, because indeed you just take, you split an observation in, let's say, one, two, three, four, five cells, depending on the uncertainty. That's, but the point is, and uh, you start to do that, at the end, uh, you lose um, the real numbers. You get, uh, for example, 0 0.5 <laughs> uh, number of occurrences in one cell. But what does it mean? And uh, speaking with us, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. But that is also something that uh, we could provide. That of sure, yes. Uh, the the point is when you sum up these probabilities together, and uh, you don't. For some statistic, can be good probably. For the, for, for some um, analysis, can be good. Yes. Uh, for some others. No, um, but yes, it's something that we could provide, yes. I think that's it. Any other question? Um, if none, thank you so much, Germanio.